So, welcome back. My name is Shoot, and I'm here on the stage to host the sessions for you. Following up, we have Carlo Piana. He's from Italy. He is a local uh, speaker, that's nice. Uh, Carlo is a, is a lawyer, a free software advocate, and a qualified attorney. He focuses on uh, his practice on software technology, uh, standardization, data protection, and digital liberties in general. And he served as an external general counsel to the Free Software Foundation Europe. And Carlo established a freelance consulting practice on IT law in 2008, where he leads a small group of IT lawyers named Array. Now, that's an IT name. Please join me in welcoming the awesome Carlo Piana to the stage. Let's give him a big hand with how open source is key to WordPress success. Thank you. I was told that after me there is a very important speaker, so I might have the shorter version of my presentation running. So, why is, why is WordPress successful tend to open source, but it's because it's open source and it's free. And that concludes my presentation. I am available to take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> no. Too short? Too short? Ah, okay. So we have a half an hour to spare, and well, let's dig into something. I'm not speaking about myself. But uh, um, currently, I'm chair of the Open Source Initiative. And um, yes, I'm a lawyer. And lawyers are boring. I try not to be. I hope not to be. So get back. This is the longer version of my presentation. What open source is? We, how many know what open source is? No, really? Uh, I mean, really. Okay. Well, for sure, it's not about the price. So the first slide was BS. It's not about the price, not about total cost of ownership or whatever. So what is open source about? In order to clarify this, I have done what any reasonable person would have done in my place. So what I have done? I'll ask ChatGPT. ChatGPT comes with a long explanation, and it has quite. It, it is quite right. Quite. Um, it speaks about source code accessibility. That's correct. Collaborative development. It's important about that. Yeah. It's about licensing. For sure, it's about licensing. I'm a lawyer. And you, if only you have a hammer, you see any problems as a nail. So license is legal. So a license is very important. Community driven, perhaps. So what are the benefits? Uh, transparency, security, flexibility, and cost effectiveness. I'm not sure about the last part. But the rest is quite correct. And it, list, it, it makes a list of successful, important. Unfortunately, the first time I tried this joke, ChatGPT gave, gave me WordPress as an example. And as much as hard as, as I tried to get it back again, I was unsuccessful. Two hours ago, WordPress was there. But the slide was done, and I couldn't repeat it. But yes, WordPress is an important part of the open source world. So, Judge GPT has it right, but not entirely right. So uh, let's us, let us concentrate on what is really, really open source at the bottom. What you need to focus on when considering if uh, an open source project is worthwhile and if it's good for you. For, for starters, what do I need to reap the advantages of open source? Besides the license, of course, because without the license, I could not do anything with an open source project. 
And for the minimum set for reaping the advantages of open source, it's source code. Without the source code, I cannot do anything. But this is it. If I have license and a source code, I'm quite good, whatever it happens afterwards. For, a, for AI, it tends to be different. For, for AI, but we're not speaking of, of this now. We are speaking ab about it later. And by the way, the open source initiative is in the process of redefining what AI, open source AI is. It's, it's in, in the process now, and it's uh, something that we are producing. So we spoke about license. License is important. And if you want to really know if some see a piece of software is open source, you need to go to the open source definition. And license must adhere to the open source definition. That's, that's the only test you can do. If it's not open OSD compliant, it is not open source. The open source is like the Ten Commandments. Of, of course, it's ten rules. And this is what defines open source. And the open source initiative that I am the chair of is the entity that for 25 years has conceived and stewarded the, the license and compared the licenses and approved licenses towards the open source definition. Nine rules out of 10 are about licenses, and only one is about open uh, source code. And only a part of this uh, requires making it available. But without this, it's not open source. You will see many projects say, oh, I am, this is MIT license, but you don't have any access to open source. This is not open source. The license is right. The source code is not. If you want to modify it, you, and it's not already in, in, a, in a modifiable way, because it's not HTML or, or JavaScript, you cannot. So it's not open source, despite the license is correct, despite you can copy it and you can distribute, but you cannot modify it and you cannot improve it. And perhaps you cannot even tell exactly what it does. Is, is it open OSD? Therefore, the reason why an open source project is successful or open source at large is successful, but not quite. If you leave this room with your mind completely blank, which is a possibility because this is not an, a, a very uh, in, a enticing uh, subject, I want you to remember this. The real success of an open source, just on the top of the quality of the software, of course, but the real reason why an open source, an open source at large is successful is the four freedoms. The freedom to use, study, modify, and distribute. And these, not per se, not because these are uh, general principles or godly sand principles. These, those free, uh, those freedoms allow permissionless innovation. You do not need to ask permission to do the four freedoms. The permission, you say, oh, but there is a license. So the, the permission is required. Yes, but the license is given upfront. You know the rules of the game before playing the game. Suppose that you start playing a game and the rules are not there or the rules change throughout the game and perhaps they are slanted towards your opponent. You will not participate. With open source, you have the code and you have the permission, and this is everything you have. This creates a game in the social science uh, way of, of, of saying it, a, a game that gives you confidence that whatever uh, happens, you have a, at least a limited set. And the only thing you have to comply with are the conditions of the license. You have the legal permission and you have the technical means. Because open source definition at the bottom is just a mean to an end. And the end are the four freedoms, and the four freedoms are the ones that have kick-started a revolution that 
allow open source to be, as such, uh, uh, to be that successful. But once you have uh, seen that the project is open source, you are not even there yet. You, you have to, uh, there are many kinds of open source. And usually you define it by copyleft, weak copyleft, and non-copyleft. Means uh, the first say, says, I want this project and everything that relates to it to be as open as possible forever. We copyleft means I want this to be open forever, but I don't mind if it mixes and matches with other things, and uh, I, it can be even proprietary. Non-copyleft means I don't care. You can turn it into proprietary. I don't want to. Say. But the important thing to remember is that copyleft doesn't mean that I am dictating someone, somebody else to do something. It's just a very simple rule. My house my rule. If you want to use my software, since I have the copyright in the software, you must comply with the condition I give you the permission. If you don't want to comply with the conditions, you don't touch my software and you are, are fine. I'm not coming to your house, you are coming to mine. And there is one important concept that you need to bear in mind. The reach of this copyleft effect, the how I dictate you to, to, to license your software under doesn't extend beyond a right conferred by the copyright. So this uh, viral thing that many say about open source is not true. You just as any copyright holder, you have the right to control not just what you have done, but anything that under the copyright law, oh, sorry, it's called a derivative. A derivative must, can, can be something that contains your software, that extends your software, or that deeply, intimately uses and interact with your software. Beyond that, there is no virality. There is nothing that reaches out. So this is, the, this is exactly the same as it happens in any kind of copyright, proprietary, open source alike. But this is just one of, extension, one of the classifications. Uh, another thing that needs to be taken care of very seriously in a project, you know, uh, it's now it's open source, but what about tomorrow? What about the holder changes their idea and pulls the rug, as, as they say? There is a ma ma sorry, many projects are in the hands of one single person, and this person is not bound by its license. So if two persons merge their code together, each of them must ask the permission of the other. If you have many people, many copyright holders, like in Linux, for instance, Linux has many copyright holders. They will never agree to change the license. This is a, a limit, but also a, 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 a reason for its success. People invest in Linux because they know there is no single company that can acquire everything else. So a project can be um, reliable in this, never to turn into another license if its, uh, its copyright is distributed, or it, it is in the hand of a foundation, and the foundation has rules for changing the software, like the Linux Foundation, the Eclipse Foundation, Apache Foundation, Mozilla Foundation. And the other thing that you need to look into a project to, to say this is going to be open source in the long run if it's a code is actually available, if you can touch it, if somebody has already downloaded it. Because once it's open source, it never come back. The new version can be relicensed. The same version can be relicensed, but the, the one in, in, in the hands of the people that's, that cannot be recounted. That cannot be taken back. 
forking. Forking is good. People, many projects fear forking for a reason. But forking is good. Forking, the possibility of forking creates a good gain. The possibility of, of receiving a fork puts pressures, pressure, incentivizes the project, the steward of the project to keep in line because, well, if anything goes south, if the project disappears, oh, the, the, the guy in Nebraska dies because that's a possibility, touch wood, okay? You, are, you have the right to fork it, take the project. There is no guarantee that a fork will happen. There is no guarantee that a fork will be successful. There might be different forks so you do, know, do not know which one to take, but at least it's better to have this possibility than not to have it. Somebody in the, in the public whispered about CRA. Mm, yes. About. CRA is Cyber Resilience Act, and it's a new piece of legislation that has one main uh, effect. It will force everybody to, to look at their own software and the software they rely on in the long run. Because there is an obligation anytime you market a project, a product containing software, including software you need to think about five years because you have to support along its life. So if you rely on a, on a project that is not viable, is not uh, reliable in the wrong run, you are in trouble because if they upstream do not update it, you need to update it. So it creates incentives to big, spend, uh, big companies or big vendors to push upstream the value, to put money upstream so that they don't have themselves to, uh, uh, to, to uh, maintain the software in the long run. So CRA is an European legislation, but it's already creating a lot of movement. Fortunately, it is the first legislation in Europe that expressly has a section, big section on open source. An open source vendor, sorry, an open source developer has nothing to fear because it's mainly ex uh, exempt from CRA, but if you sell support services, you are monetizing it, then you become a vendor. And then you are bound to the obligation, due diligence, uh, maintenance, fixing uh, the bugs, fixing vulnerabilities, make vulnerability study. So these are things that uh, will create a lot of, uh, of changes in the worldwide process, uh, projects. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? It will make open source more, a more adult of age. Open source is 25 years old. No, it's more than that. But the concept of open source is 25 years old. So you are of age. You need to take. Um, take care of the, the things they're doing. Or at least somebody needs to be a, a foundation, a consortium, a client. Somebody has to take care because uh, it's too important. Software is too important in the world to leave it open recklessly. And now for something completely different. Are we paying attention? Yes, we are paying attention. Carlo, thank you. Um, I'm here just to wake you up because, okay, like you said, legal is boring. Um, yeah, but let's see. Who in the audience is working on content or developing code or CSS? Just raise your hands. Let me see. Okay, so that's a lot. Great. Now, who of this audience is using sometimes tools like ChatGPT or AI to speed up their development or their come writing on, skills. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, show hands, be honest. Be honest. Yes, yes, yes. Now, 
One last question. Who is aware of the consequences of this use of AI or ChatGPT for the final license of the code? Show me your hands if you are fully aware. Uh huh. <laughs> Carlo, you can handle that, right? Okay. Then it's something that interests you. I've got some some. This is our not final thoughts are developing, but this is whether you can use it and you can own the software and you can distribute the software that ChatGPT or Copilot does for you. First, how an LLM, a large language model, works. Uh, the most important concept it's training on software. So it uses software, existing software. Oh, we need this software. Can somebody put my slides on? Because, guys? It's always the same. We play the tree. I don't, I don't do that. No. OK. So an LLM uh, is based on training data. And these training data software, in this case, are mostly copyrighted, are entirely copyrighted, let's say. Uh, it's open source, it's proprietary, but it's always copyrighted. This is important. It's not just for the fun of it. But there is an ongoing discussion. So oh, the model is reading my code, so uh, it's something, it's, it's, it's taking my code, and there is something of my code in the You remember derivative? Remember derivative is the reach of your copyright? To me, it's not derivative of the training data. And if it's derivative, it's fair use anyway. So, no. But the information and the code it's not lost. Somewhere is in there. Only you cannot read it anymore. Unless in certain cases, it can resurface. There are, in e there are I images that you say, oh, I want to do a two players playing so soccer. And, and, and there is a famous case that there is a, 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 a picture that is identical, almost identical. Well, the, the leg is slanted, but it's almost identical to some copyrighted. So this is, this is, this is one possible problem. Uh, but before, can I still claim copyright on the things that ChatGPT does for me? Uh, well, not exactly. Because copyright requires creativity, Cre creation of a human mind, not AI. Not even monkeys. There is a case of a monkey taking a selfie. There is a, you can say, you can look on uh, Wikipedia, monkey selfie, copyright, you, you, you get the idea. Well, on the one hand, OpenAI doesn't want to have copyright, that's good. And Copilot doesn't want to have copyright on your work, that's good. But you yourself can claim copyright on that. Well, just having paid for uh, OpenAI, just having arranged the tools is not sufficient. There needs to be intent, creative intent. So, and that translates for software in choice. Process and decisions made by a human being. How can you s make evident that there has been a choice? Well, you have to document the process. Be paranoid about documenting the process. If you want to use it, be paranoid about documenting the process. This is not the only way. If by the way, the AI Act will uh, require you to say that there is AI produced maze stuff in, in your process, but that's another thing. And always proceed in small chunks. Small chunks will give you the opportunity to say, I've done this small, uh, uh, this small uh, function or this small thing, and, uh, but I have arranged and that's a work of my productivity. And always, of course, always document those decisions and take those decisions. Don't just uh, say, oh, th this is what it was spewed by ChatGPT. But most important, and this is the less uh, important, 
decision, the less important, because it doesn't have a final answer. Is my code, or the code that I've extracted from JGPT or Copilot, a derivative of the ones that ChatGPT have been exposed to for their training? There is no final question. No, sorry, no final answer. The question is final, but the answer is not. How a judge will tell if your code is a derivative of another's? Of course, if you have copied it, there is no question. That's, or if it's just taking it and, and modify, that's a derivative. But there is a thing called non-literary copying. If you take something and you transform it, or, or you, even if you remember something and write it. This is why, by the way, if you leave your company and decide to do the same thing as you have done in the, in the company and start your own company, never code yourself. Write the specs, give the specs to, to another guy and have them to write the code, okay? Because your brain is more powerful than it seems. If you have been exposed that's, uh, to, to software, it's difficult to take it back. The elements, so a judge will take the arbitrary, arbitrary um, elements in the first piece of software and see they are the same in the second. So maybe errors or maybe comments, something which is not functional, something which is not dictated by something external. Because Copyright only protects the form of expression, doesn't protect which, something which is compulsory. Opening bracket, closing bracket, that's not copyrighted. Anything that goes in between, that's protected, probably. And the element must be arbitrary. It doesn't cover external uh, constraints. So how would you tell if you can say, oh, it's coincident, it happens. There are so few choices that I could have made. That's just a coincidence. So what are the odds? How, can, how likely is that two different developers would have come with the same exact code as you have come? So how many degrees of freedom? Uh, and this is a statistical problem. It depends on how many choices you could have made in one case in two cases, and you, you can see it goes with the exponential. Ah, oh no, sorry. It was with, um, I don't know, my math is escaping me. It's, it's very, the, the more these small elements are repeated in the code, the more it's likely that it's not coincidence. And the same can happen. Suppose that um, you are Asking to, uh, you're asking the uh, judge GPT to produce a long list, long, 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 long function. And this long function is something that only two programs in the world have ever done. It's quite likely that it will, it will come up as, as, as such. So the, uh, the, other pr the other part of the problem is that you have been exposed to the source code because ChatGPT, because Copilot have been exposed. So it's more likely than this is a non-literary copying because you have been exposed. There is an explanation other than sheer coincidence. And so if you write code using ChatGPT or Copilot, it's a decision. I cannot tell you not to do it. But it's a decision you have to take with wisdom, with consideration, with deliberation. I know there is a finite, finite, but not null possibility that somebody looks the code. There are, there are applications that run uh, these checks in, in, in search for copying, and your, your code can become targeted uh, with a, a copyright claim because uh, and if you have done uh, it with JGPT, you cannot say, oh, it's, uh, it was just spewed out of OAI. You, say, you have copied it. And you say, def your defense is, it's AI. 
That is not going to work. So please consider it's going to be much harder to prove that it's just a coincidence. There are a lot of cases now in the States, and so they are going to shape our understanding of uh, AI-produced copyrighted material. But it's very likely that somehow not the models and the companies running these models, these large models, have enough. We are not that concerned. We are concerned about your code because that is going to be a, a real possible uh, conundrum. So if at all possible, don't do that, or do that just for very small pieces, uh, for completing, for commenting, for uh, making sure that the, the, the code is well formed, or that uh, for auto completion of, of the variables that you have chosen. But for more complex, many companies say no use whatsoever, F anything. To me, it's too radical. If you ask a lawyer, can I do something, the lawyer will invariably start with, well, it depends. And it really depends. So um, it was not that boring, was it? So uh, that concludes my presentation. And I am ready now seriously to take your question. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you. This was very inspiring. Let's see if there's anyone with questions. OK, we're setting up a questions. mic. Questions. 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 Yes, mics are fine. OK. We have two mics set up for questions. Anyone want to share any ideas? No one. Don't be shy. OK. Either it was too clear or it was too obscure. Which one? No. Or the audience is shot. Or maybe the audience is here for Matt. Um, and they don't give a F. Uh, oh, no, I don't think so. I think they're for he here for you. <laughs> no? OK, well, actually, I'm very inspired by this. Uh, you just opened my eyes with a couple of things. And uh, I hope for the audience as well that this is going to be a really uh, brain changer. And uh, it needs a change of attitude. That's, uh, that's my, uh, my uh, thought. So please be aware of what Carlo told. Grab his, uh, uh, his presentation, download it. Make sure that you uh, learn it or know it by heart. OK, Carlo, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a small gift for you. Um, it's, t it's something Italian, but uh, it will be, maybe it will be useful to you. If it's Italian, it's good. Thank you very much, Carla. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, everybody.